All right, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, I should say thank you to the friends of the library for sponsoring our food today and beverages. Um, the food is from Elvis. to introduce Julie and her husband Jim. They raise Himalayan yak for fiber, pack animals, milk, and meat. They are sustainable producers working to protect the environment and the health of their guests at their new venture, which is called Yak Farmstead. No, Yak Ridge Cabins and Farmstead. Okay. All right, so please help me welcome Julie and Jim. Janet, and, and thank you for the invitation. We're really delighted to be here. And you know, we are really just at the ground level of getting this um, um, venture going. So we're just starting. We're learning as we're going, but hopefully we can share a little bit about the things that we've learned about Yak and about becoming new farmers well into middle age. So we're, we're excited about this. Um, but Yak Ridge is the, the name of our property. We're building a, a new home, and then on adjacent property, we have 10 acres where we're building guest cabins. And then we'll also be um, housing our yaks, um, bees, um, poultry, garden. Um, um, in fact, Jim just ordered some orchard trees um, today. So we'll have um, a, a real um, farmstead going over the, the course of the next year. And if you do have questions, just feel free to jump in. This is just a quick little picture of the cabins in progress. But we're building um, this year just three cabins, two, two bedroom cabins and one um, studio cabin. Um, a lot of the wood is coming out of the Black Hills National, National Forest. It's the bug pine. Um, so we're using a sustainable resource. We're using um, the um, Bridger steel roofs, um, doing a number of other things that are real sustainable too. So trying to be as environmentally um, friendly as we can. And the farmstead is really going to have um, several different components. So probably the most exciting for us to, is the yaks. Um, and then also honeybees. Um, we've been learning through a friend of Jim's who's been involved in um, raising bees for honey for about 40 years. And um, Jim put together um, three hives this winter and is going to be working on a couple more of those. And then our bees are scheduled to come around the 1st of May. Um, poultry. So to start off, we're looking at about four dozen chickens. And we've had chickens in the past that we've raised for eggs. We did that um, in town here. And so we're looking forward to having a, a much larger flock. Um, and although, you know, apparently in town, believe it or not, there is a statute that if you have three acres or more, you don't tether your chickens, and you don't have any <coughs> um, buildings that are um, within 150 feet of your neighbor's closest inhabited building, um, and a couple of other things you're actually allowed to happen in town. Um, so, um, but hopefully down the road there'll be some more opportunities for other people to raise them too. But we understand that there's a huge demand for local eggs. I don't know if any of you have farm fresh eggs versus the grocery store eggs, but they're just a huge difference. And if you crack open an egg and put them side by side, and you look at the height of the yolk and how it's round rather than flat, and how the white stays to the yolk and doesn't spread out, and it's nice and bright and almost orange instead of yellow, and the flavor's so much better. So um, having access to those um, local free range eggs, I think is pretty exciting. And I know there are some um, local egg fans in the group and a few people who've had chickens in the past. Fruit trees as well, and we're looking at things again that are going to be suitable to the climate. So some things that are um, bush like raspberries and blackberries and service berries, <coughs> but also apples and wild plums and assortment of things like that. Um, we're really fortunate in that the property that we're on um, is really diverse. So, we have some valley area that's got really rich soil. In fact, when they were trenching for utilities, there was a point where they were down six feet and they were still in topsoil. Um, so it's just beautiful. Yeah, I know. Now we also have we also have some areas where there is absolutely nothing at all. So this this picture here in the center, it's kind of hard to see, um, but through the distance at the top of what we're calling Yak Ridge, you can actually see. Party, and you can see the profile of Washington um, oh, wow. in the distance. But on the top of that ridge, it's really just rock outcrop. So there's not much of any soil um, um, to speak of. And then we have everything in between. But um, with the diversity of the soil and the land, 
We do also have some really beautiful oaks, some aspens, some birch, and of course a lot of ponderosa pine. And then there are also some, <coughs> some willows and some other shrub-like things as well. And lots of wildflowers, so we're excited to see what they'll be like in the spring. And then we're also looking at produce too. We'll probably do a few things this year, but most of those will come a year from now when we have more time to prepare. But um, vegetables, um, and then also um, flowers as well. Um, and then timber. Um, although um, the land that we purchased um, was part of a bigger ranch, um, and it had really been um, maintained well. The, um, the people who we bought it from were managing for pine beetle. In fact, they have still about 120 acres. And when they had their land inspected last year, and most of it's wooded, they had one buck pine tree on it, and that was it. And so they've really done a great job of, of managing for it. Um, but through the construction process and other things, there were some trees that we took down, probably not more than a couple of dozen, but we have um, half a room full of, of wood and things that we'll be using, but also um, for our cabin goers and other people. And then our plan for next year is to build a farm stand that we'll have open probably just on Saturday mornings during the um, summer and fall. Uh, but we'll be using some of the things that we had from Dakota Time, so we hope to put um, fresh croissants and some pastries and breads and other things available, um, as well as what we might grow on the, the land and honey, um, as well as um, potentially some yak meat at that point. Yes. Where are you located then? On Cosmos Road. So if any of you have been to the Cosmos Road, if any of you have been to the Cosmos Mystery Area, or take grandkids or kids there. Uh, if you go sign. past the cosmos, we're about a half mile back in there. So we're um, between Keystone and Rockerville. Um, theoretically and um, officially, we're in Rapid City, but we're really closest to Keystone. the Cosmos Road, but you go past the Cosmos parking area to get to where we are. So we're back here. So we feel really fortunate. Um, we have more <coughs> service on two sides and neighbors that we know on the other, so it's really it's a, a nice spot to be in. Um, and why yaks? You know, it's, it is a pretty unusual thing to do, and a lot of people have asked us, how did you end up with yaks as something that you want to do? And honestly, um, you know, there, there are a number of different reasons, but as we were doing research last year and looking at what kind of animals that we could, could we have for grazing, um, we've always talked about having goats or sheep or some other things. We found that there were um, different kinds of roadblocks. One of them is that we know that we have mountain lions in the area. We have a trail cam up, so we've seen lions and we've also seen prints and we know obviously that they're in the area. Um, and that's definitely issues for sheep and for goats and smaller livestock. Um, as we read more too about sheep, that's always been one of my goals. And you look at the issues with how they've been bred, the issues then that you um, generate with lambing, the commitment and triplets and just a lot of other things that we weren't sure we were ready for that, that kind of a commitment. Um, and then there were just a lot of other things. The, the fencing issues, again, where we are, we have a lot of rock. Um, and a lot of change in slope. Our property um, goes up 200 feet from the lowest to the highest point. Um, and so there's a lot of challenges there. And the guardian animal issue then actually is what led us to yaks. When we were re reading um, for sheep and goats, um, yaks were, were some of the animals that people suggested that you could use for guardian animals. And then um, the, the yaks, we, have, um, we, we like to visit Buffalo, Wyoming and are usually there a couple of times a year. And there's a herd just outside of Buffalo um, as you're going west, and we've kind of admired it um, from a distance for years. Um, Jim also spent um, a summer in Nepal a number of years ago, so was introduced to them then. And we kind of thought, well, you know, it maybe is a good option. And then the, I think the final thing is um, the ridge where we are um, looks like the back of the yak. So we kind of thought all those things it was kind of meant. Um, but uh, I think the most important kind of from a practical uh, perspective is that they are multi-purpose animals. Um, we've had a chance to enjoy their meat. We went to a ranch um, in central Wyoming this summer and had a chance to try the meat for the first time there. And then it's pretty much
much the only red meat besides um, local lamb that we've eaten for the, the past nine months or so. There's a rancher north of Kimball who raises yak really just for meat. Um, and so we've been buying that. Um, the other thing is pack animals. Um, they're incredibly strong. And, you know, they have been domesticated in the Himalayas for about 5,000 years um, and used primarily as pack animals and for milking. And so they have a, a docile nature in general. They can carry a huge percentage of their weight. Um, you don't need to carry feed for them. They can just graze on what's there. And as long as you're going someplace where there's water, they can drink from the stream. So you're not packing anything extra for them. Jim and um, our sons really enjoy backpacking in the Wind Rivers and in the Bighorns. So they're looking forward to having some in a couple of years that we raise from babies to be able to take backpacking. Um, and then uh, the other thing is the value of their fiber. Even though they don't produce a ton of it, the fiber is really high quality. Um, one way that people look at the quality of fiber is to look at the micron count, so how fine it is. And yak is very fine. In fact, the um, rancher that we're getting three or two of our yaks from, he had yaks this um, winter at the um, National Stock Show that were down to 12 microns. So really, really, he, one of his yaks won. So for that, so very, very good fiber. It's also hypoallergenic, so um, people don't tend to be allergic to it. You know, wool has that lanolin, which some people um, do have issues with, but the, the yak is hypoallergenic. And they, the yak actually have two different kinds of fiber. They have the downy um, fiber, which is typically what people would use for um, spinning and then turning into clothing or other things. But then they also have guard hair, so kind of the skirt around their belly. And those fibers are used um, to make wigs. So um, the movie industry uses them a lot. If you remember Chewbacca from Star Wars, he was a, a yak product. A lot of mannequins are made from yaks. Um, if you saw John Adams, the PBS series, um, that um, those wigs are made from yak. Um, and yak, the fiber is formed <coughs> on an annual basis. So you get a little bit of uh, fiber every year, um, and are then and not, um, you don't shear it. Another reason was sustainability. Um, they're low impact, you know, some of the grazing animals really go all the way down to the roots and they're really hard on your, your natural grasses. But yeah, it's going to be more friendly with that. They also have a high feed to weight gain. I think part of that has to do just with the efficiencies that their bodies um, developed in the Himalayas over the years. Um, they also birth easy. They haven't been bred to produce big, excuse me, big babies. So most of the young yaks are 25 to 35 pounds. So they're relatively small, maybe a third of, I've, I've been talking to a few people who are having calves this year that are 100 pounds when they're born. So these guys are little. Um, so that means that they typically don't need much help. They can birth on their own. Um, we've also heard that they can withstand temperatures well below freezing um, as, as newborns, so they're really hardy. Um, the um, yak ranch that's in Nebraska, where our males are coming from, they were hit with the Atlas blizzard a year and a half ago, and they have no shelter for their yaks at all, um, didn't lose a single animal. Um, and so they, they can really withstand um, difficult um, climates as well, too. Um, the ranch that we visited near Cody, Wyoming, too, those ranchers, they actually spend three months in, in um, Florida every winter. And they leave their yaks, they have a spring nearby, and they graze and break through the ice, and they're fine on their own for three months. So good hardy um, yaks. Also, again, well suited for the Black Hills. Um, the climate is really a good option. You know, they prefer things that are going to be a little bit cooler. Obviously, we'll get some heat in the summer, but being in the hills and having some shade, um, that will be good for them, and they'll be fine with the snow. They love to climb, they love the altitude. Um, the geography, in terms of having rocks, uh, that prevents you from having to trim their hooves, and so on. Um, and again, um, Jim's um, trek to Nepal also helped to encourage us to look at them. Um, and the other thing that we found in talking with other people who raise yaks, and the, I don't know, we've been to half a dozen or so different farms and ranches and then to the um, yak activities that were part of the Denver Stock Show last year. And they really do have personalities. Um, a lot of people, I mean, 
they have their pasture pets, the yaks come and call them, they like treats, they like to have their ears scratched, um, they, they like that, that human interaction. Um, and they are really inquisitive. The, this first picture um, is a cow, her name is Amber. She was at a farm we visited in Minnesota this fall, and she just wanted to get inside the little four-wheeler. Um, the guy in the middle, um, he's actually one of, he's a really big bull. He's close to 1,200 pounds. He's at the ranch in Nebraska. His name is Yoda. Um, his father was Chewbacca. He's a, a famous guy. Yeah. Um, but even though he's this big guy and he's one of their three primary bulls, he can't wait to come over and have a cookie. Um, so they're, they're really pretty sweet. And then the last one is from a, a ranch by Cody that we visited. And um, they had a calf that um, they were bottle feeding. His name was Al. And he was about, I think at that point, he was maybe 10 days old. Um, but um, he was hanging out in their, their backyard um, with their two dogs. And they were bottle feeding him. They were already starting to pack train him. That's one of the things that they do. So they just have one of those little dog backpacks. Um, so they're putting that on him, and they started that when he was about two days old. Um, but really, um, really sweet. And then this is the herd that um, we picked out that the, the boys could actually be here any time. Our fencing isn't quite ready for them. And the girls are scheduled to come um, in May. The cow that, we're, um, that we bought um, is still um, nursing and she'll be weaning her calf in May. So when that's done, they'll be headed our way. So this first one is Hugh. He's our future herd sire. Um, he's from um, Nebraska. And um, he's got the nice little heart on his forehead. And um, he's considered what they would call um, a trim. Yaks come in different colors. So he's black and he's got some white. The white makes him a trim. And um, they know through genetics that if you breed a trim with a royal, the royals are black and white, you can get royals, or you can get trims, or you can get solids. So we kind of like the idea of being able to have some variety and being surprised with what um, the calves are that are produced. Should I tell them why his name is Hugh? <laughs> so um, this is a name that our boy, we have two sons there. Um, one will be 21 next week and the other will be 25 next month. And so they decided Hugh was a good name because um, he's named after Hugh Hefner. And the hope is that he's going to love the ladies. <laughs> and um, also from Jim's perspective, from training animals, they need one syllable with names. So um, we've got a, an easy one to pronounce. For production purposes, how yes. old are they before the typical? Before they're processed? Well, no, before they can um, so the recommendation is that the um, heifers be two years old before they're bred, and for the males, around two and a half or three is about the time that they can start siring offspring. You AI them? No, you don't. Um, th that's one thing with yaks, it's different. They do have a cycle every month, um, but it's for 24 hours, and so it's almost impossible to to be able to predict when that would be. So you pretty much need to leave them with the bull. And there are some people who have that um, very specifically scheduled. There are some people, which is where we're getting our females from, they just kind of let them do what they want. Um, but what I think our plan is, at least that we've talked about so far, is that we will allow the cows and the, and the bull to be together so that we will have calves being born in March, April, and May. So we think that'll fit well as far as the weather, everything that we've heard and from people we've talked to, that you just get, um, you really get almost an extra year of growth um, compared to the animals that are born in the fall. And their gestation time? Eight months for females and eight and a half for males. So if they have a bull calf, it takes an extra two weeks. And they'll, they'll breed while they're still weaning. The recommendation is that you um, allow them to, to nurse for six months and then wean at about that point. So when we have um, the one female that we're um, getting, um, she had a calf in I think early, or let's see, sometime in November, 
but um, she's been real friendly with the bull lately, so we're hoping she'll actually come for it to us. So we'll have a calf in the fall if everything goes well. Um, and then this is um, Houdini. So he's the steer. He's uh, about two and a half, um, maybe pushing three. So our plans are to really have him in um, the freezer land pasture, and um, then in the fall um, he'll be processed. And typically, um, from what we've heard from everyone, the yield is roughly 50%. Um, so on the hoof to what you process will yield about 50%. Now, is that like where they store grass similar to a bison? It's really, um, really more bone. There's not much for fat. One of the things that we learned that was really interesting, I think part of the health benefits and why we like the meat is that the yaks, um, they don't marble, so their fat um, goes to the outside of their muscle, but they actually um, retain a lot of water. In fact, if you look at the nutritional labels, um, yak has a bit more sodium than um, beef would have. This is a bit of an assumption here, but I'm assuming that that's probably part of the reason why they retain more water in their muscle. And so as a result, you know, like we, um, you know, until this year we were pretty much eating only grass-fed beef, but you know, if you cook things to medium well or beyond, it can be dry, and the same thing with bison. Whereas what we found with the yak, because of the moisture content, they stay much more tender and much more juicy, but it's that way because of water, not because of marbled fat. So it's, it's healthy. <coughs> Uh, this is Yinny, so she's the cow um, that's coming from Montana. She's on a, a ranch um, south of um, Missoula. And the calf she has right now is her second calf. She had one last year as well. Um, and one of the things we also learned, I like cattle, but yaks can't um, breed every year for more than 20 years um, and be healthy about that. So um, the ranch in Nebraska, they have um, a cow that's 27 and one that's 28, and they had calves a year ago, which is pretty, and they, they sort of think they're probably done at this point, um, but, um, but they can breed for a long time and, and, be, be, and produce really good young even at that age. How about how long then do they live? Do you know that they're after? Around 30 years is kind of a, a long life expectancy, at least that's what we've had. I don't know that they've run across anyone else. Are the births all similar? Almost always. Um, we've talked to a few people who sort of have heard of twins, but I don't know that we talked to anybody who actually had had twins in their herd. So usually just singles. And this is Mocha. So she's one of the um, the heifers. And um, again, she's a royal, so she's got that white and, um, and black mix, and that's what Yinny is as well. So our plan is essentially <coughs> to start with those three um, royal females that will produce um, a mixture of things with uh, the trim bull. And then this is Tika, which means um, pretty little flower. Mm -hmm. I thought that was good. Um, and I have a couple of videos here too. I'll see if I can, you can kind of see some yaks in action. Oh, hang on a second. Janet, I've got the video on this screen, but it, this screen and this one are not matching. I'm sorry. <laughs> You can see with some of them, they, have, they run like horses with their tails up. They have long, um, furry kinds of tails. And then, um, how, about how many pounds are they when, if you butcher them? 
So most people are processing them maybe when they're 100, or excuse me, 800 to 1,000 pounds. This is a ranch that's in um, Colorado. But yeah, so they come out for their treats. And, uh, do they shed their bones? They don't. Mm -hmm. Nope, so they, they keep their horns. So about how many people do ranch the yak? Do you have any idea how many ranchers? One of the things that we did was we joined um, IYAC, which is the International Yak Association. And I think they have maybe 150 or 160 members maybe total, um, based on kind of how elections and things went this year. Um, and that's across the U.S. Um, some of those members are not ranchers, um, either because they're retired or like us who are just, you know, getting started. Um, and some people who, because they love the fiber, um, are supporting the organization. Um, and then there are also, you know, a fair number of people who ranch but aren't members. So in terms of the people that we visited, I'd say half of them were not IAC members. And about half of them have them. How much does the processed meat cost and what does it taste like? So in terms of the processed meat, you know, in South Dakota, at least at this point, the going rate is about $8 a pound per ground. And then kind of goes up from there. The, um, I do have some brochures here that you can take, but Jim Anderson is one of the ranchers that um, we've talked with and we we've toured his ranch. He's in Gann Valley, which is north of Kimball. And he has Dakota grass-fed meat. So he has yak, beef, and he also has lamb as well. And he sells that locally through Red Road, Red Road Co-op, uh, Main Street Market, and Strawberry Market. Um, and the yak, well, if you had any of the tikka masala, obviously it has some curry on it, but that was yak-based. Um, the way I would describe... Andrew described it the other day. Okay, go ahead, yeah. You know, we had some. We had a couple over our house uh, for dinner, and they enjoy beef, and they never had yak before. And he couldn't put his finger on. He said, "You know, you eat this, and you know it's different than the normal beef you get from the grocery store." And he thought for a while, and he said, "You know," and it was filet mignon we had. He said, "I have to place it exactly at a really long-aged beef steak that he's had only a couple times in his life. Very tender, very moist, and just that." When you age it for a long period of time, it changes the flavor a little bit. That's how we that's how we describe it. I'd say I had made yak burgers for my kids the other day, and they all loved them. And they just said it's just kind of like a sweeter hamburger. I mean, it, it just is delicious. When and how do you harvest the wool? And doesn't it just get tangled all up? I mean, some of them are so dry. Yeah, and for some of them, it will felt up if they get a lot of moisture. They're not brushed regularly, but um, and we did um, practice a little bit and got demonstrations when we were in Denver. But most of the people are brushing kind of April May time frame on an annual basis, and sometimes people will put them into a squeeze chute and brush them there. Some of them are just thrilled to be brushed, <coughs> and you know they'll come over for their brushing. Um, for That's the how they get the wool, or do they actually don't shear them? No, they don't shear them. So they brush them. Right. Yeah, and they brush them with. Um, Combs that have really long ties on them, so you know, three or four inches. So, yeah, and it just kind of brushes, brushes out. Yeah. All right, my friends. They are pack animals. They How are. do we compare with the donkey or mule? Are they better than mules? They are. <laughs> and Jim, you know, I don't know. You might want to. You've done more of the pack research. Yeah. Um, they they modify the packs that they use for mules for. Uh, for the yaks, and just because it's a different body shape. But they will go longer than mules, they'll carry percent body weight, you know, they, they generally the cut offs about 15%, and they'll go places that mules can't go, even though mules go places horses can't go, the yaks will go straight up over rocks. They actually love to play king of the mountain. If there's a big rock, they'll find a way to get on top of it and stand right, up. But you lead them just like donkey. You do. You just, uh, you, yeah, I'll lead and just lead them in. And, uh, and once they, if they're, if they're raised from the time they were just born, they say you rarely use the lead. They just want to follow you in like a dog. Okay. <coughs> what, what are they related to? 
to it? Like, are they related to buffalo, or what kind of are the family? Are they? Animals? Yep, they're bovine, so they're related to cattle and to bison, mm -hmm. and they can can be interbred. Hmm. And so there are some people who do breed yak and cattle um, for different reasons. Is there an English word for yak, or is it just a word? Um, it is a word, and it is, um, it's a Himalayan word, and yak, from a traditional sense, is a male, oh. and a knack is a female. Oh. But the English have adapted yak to cover both males and females. <coughs> Are they also related to muskox? I believe so, but I've not heard that anyone breeds them, interbreeds them. And then the other things that, again, we have planned are the um, chickens. So we plan to raise those and then have um, eggs that will be available to sell. sell. Um, in the past, when we had chickens, we did the rainbow layers so that we had brown and dark brown and green and blue eggs. And that's our, our plan as well. And you know, to, we had breeds, we had probably, I don't know, 10 different breeds, um, but, but ones that do well in this climate, that are regular layers, um, that, that lay, um, you know, large eggs or so. Um, but I think we'll probably have a few bantams. There's a few of those that we really enjoy. Um, so we'll have some, <laughs> some little eggs as well. Um, and then bees, I mentioned that. A couple of these, um, this first picture here is actually taken on Sunday. Um, the man that's been um, serving kind of as a mentor for us, it was his first day to go into his hives um, in the spring. So we went through, I don't know, maybe a quarter of the hives that he has, um, and essentially just doing regular health checks to see how they're doing, to see if he could find um, the queen, to see what their honey stores were like, to see if they, they needed to be supplemented at all. And um, there was one hive where the queen um, had not made it. It was fascinating that um, he, he knew even before he lifted a, a single um, tray out um, that the queen was gone because they had a completely different um, buzz about them. But you can tell that this is a, a hive that's stressed and they're nervous. You know, something's wrong. So the, the queen is probably gone. And um, it's hard to see, but. He um, paints a green dot. But, um, he paints a green dot on the back of the queen, so that um, it actually uses a different colored dot based on the year that the queens are born. Um, but so it's, it was just uh, uh, just fascinating. We learned learned a lot from the experience, and he found you know eggs and um, in a couple of the hives. Um, new fuzzy little bees that had just been born. And then also there were, I think two of the hives, there were um, bees that had already collected pollen. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if um, there were past flowers or something else, but they had legs with um, filled with pollen and they were doing their little figure eight dance, mm -hmm. um, trying to tell the rest of the bees where to find them. So it was really cool. And then the hives on the right, those are the, Jim actually set those out this weekend. Those are our hives. Um, and again, we hope to add a couple more. Um, and then the bees are ordered, so they should be here around the first of first of May. And we, um, you know, when we had to come to time, we worked really hard to use whatever we could um, that was local. And a lot of the baking that we did, we replaced sugar, and we, we did not use corn syrup, um, but used honey in place of that when we could. And so then we've gotten even more and more. Um, into that, um, the gentleman Tom Rapis, who has the um, bees on the left. We've been buying his uh, his honey this last year, but we really um, try to use as much of that as we can in place of, of sugar when we're mm -hmm. we're baking. And you know, again, in terms of our process, um, we're not young chickens anymore. Um, but um, you know, my great great grandparents homesteaded in eastern South Dakota. We've always gardened. We've always grown things. We've had chickens and other things off and on, and always kind of had a dream of having some sort of a farm. And have, and have generally lived places where we've had a little bit of acreage, so we've had some space or had had big gardens. And so, you know, decided this was really something that we, we wanted to um, to try to, to tackle. 
And one of the things that we've um, been doing this year that's been <coughs> just a phenomenal experience is that um, we've been taking the Dakota Rural Action Farm Beginnings class that started um, in early um, December. And they offer a class we meet every other week on Saturdays. And then we have homework assignments. We've got a binder like this and a couple of textbooks. And then um, we'll continue to meet into April. And then after that, we'll be assigned mentors. And then we'll be doing farm tours over the course of the, the summer and fall. So it's really been a great experience to learn about the whole process. Um, their approach to it, too, is very holistic. So, you know, um, we're looking at the water cycle and the mineral cycle and um, the community cycle. You know, what is it that the community wants and how do you fit into that as you make your plans? And how do you look at the litter that's on the ground that supports a healthy um, soil? And what do you do long term in terms of transitioning that land that hopefully is in a better place, but then to your um, offspring or to other family members or the next generation of farmers? So it's really been been great, and we've heard from you know a whole range of uh, different speakers every weekend. I think there's probably at least seven or eight different people who are presenting on different topics. Um, so it's it's really been, um, been great, and we have um, in the class there's another couple that's about our age, but the rest of the couples are really young people and people who are looking at starting with a few acres or maybe ten acres and doing produce or there, there's one um, young family that's looking at raising hogs. Um, there are other people. There's a, um, a couple of family or a couple of couples that are from the base. They have a, a warrior farmer um, kind of network. So there are a couple of um, couples from the base who are um, involved in that as well. So it's really, really been a good experience. Also with Dakota Rural Action, it's a group that I've been a member of for many years. They're based out of um, Brookings, but there is um, a Black Hills chapter and there's some other chapters in other rural areas of South Dakota. But they're really all about farm to table issues, about land owner rights, um, they're about um, quality of life in South Dakota and so on. They do a lot of really good things. Um, one of the things that they started about six months ago too is a local online food co-op. So once a month you can go online if you're a producer and list what you have available. And then members can go on and decide what they'd like to purchase. So it's kind of like going to a farmer's market, but you do it online and you can order from different vendors. And then um, at the end of the month, you go then to one place in Rapid City and pick up everything that you've ordered. Um, so it's a great, great way to support um, local foods, um, but also get good, clean, healthy food. Um, and then mentors, so we've, we've been fortunate with the, um, Tim Hardy, the rancher um, by Hay Springs, um, has been really helpful. Um, Jim Anderson, the rancher um, north of Kimball, has been helpful. Um, and then Tom with the bees and others who've really been happy to share you know, their knowledge. Um, so that's been really good for us. And again, IAC, they've got a lot of great online resources. It's getting a little bit dated, but they did a really comprehensive study on the IAC itself. This is an online piece that they have that you can download for free. Um, and then every year for the last like, 15 or 20 years or maybe more, they've had about um, four or five days of activities that are part of the National Western Stock Show in Denver. And this year there are, I think, were maybe 110 or 115 yaks that they brought there were in, the, in the stockyards. And there were probably 15 producers, I think, who had their yaks. They had um, a fiber show. They had um, presentations on um, how to get the fiber. There were presentations on milking yaks, um, also on the, the meat aspect, to how to go about the labeling, to making meat um, cuts and products for people, but then also even for um, pet treats, um, and then they had a grill set up every day, so they were providing samples of, um, of yak that people who were there just for the yaks, but also anyone who was at the stock show um, could come through and, and sample. Um, so it was, that's really been, um, been interesting. They also do a registration, so if you're interested, you, know, you can have your yaks registered, and um, they have you know, the family tree information, so you can go online and 
go back several generations and mm -hmm. see, you know, who uh, who the ancestors of your yaks are um, as well, which is really helpful if you're looking at certain characteristics and also, you know, some people believe in um, inline breeding and others want um, diversity, but you can look at that and then, you know, determine the colors or whether you want something that's woollier or uh, whatever it is that you We're also really big into, you know, as I mentioned with Dakota Time, we really focused on buying as much local as we could. We figured that out of our food um, expenses, depending on the time of year, as much as 30% or more is what we would have considered <coughs> locally produced um, food. Um, and a lot of reasons for it, you know, I, again, having um, farming in my background and gardening, um, I mean, I think it's just a good thing to do, but you're if you buy local, more than likely you're going to buy things that are ready to eat rather than things that are ready to travel. So you're going to get things that are healthier and fresher. They're going to taste better. Um, it's obviously um, much better for the local economy too. We do quite a bit of um, traveling. Wisconsin has a huge um, focus on local foods and they've got some great publications that talk about just the million dollar impact you can make in a relatively small community. If everyone just bought $10 a week of local food, um, and if you are giving money to a local farmer, more than likely they're going to be spending their money here in the community and helping whatever industry it is that they support, and those dollars turn over here. So it's good economically as well as, as, as being good for you. Dakota Rural Action also has a local foods directory. They have a print version that they're working on in 2015 issue right now, um, but it's also available online. So you can go online and say, okay, I'm in the Black Hills, I'm looking for eggs, or I'm looking for meat, or I'm looking for apples, or whatever it is, and they'll direct you to the producers who are supplying those. Gregson Gardens, which is between um, Keystone and Hermosa, they were a really big producer for us as far as greens, um, edible flowers, um, herbs, um, they also have berries and apples and other kinds of fruit. Um, they're a great resource. Um, the farmer's market, obviously, as well. And then, um, you know, there are the Grand Root Main Street Market and Strawberry Market also do really a, a great job of um, just local foods. Staple and Spice has some local honey, has some local meats as well. And then also um, CSAs, there are a few of those around. I don't know if there's any in Rapid City right now that still have openings, but CSAs are community supported agriculture. So what happens with those is essentially at the beginning of the season, so like right now, people can buy shares into the CSA. And then when they start producing every week for 15 or 20 weeks, depending on, on the CSA, you get a portion of whatever is growing by that producer. Um, and so it's a great way to, to get that local food just as fresh as you can. You don't know what you're going to get or how much it is. So, you know, the beginning of the season, it might be pretty limited to radishes and maybe some fresh flowers and some eggs or other things and you might have a little bit some weeks you might have a lot just because of what the weather conditions and other things were but there's a couple of really good ones in the area Bear View Gardens and Sturgis I think they're the only or um, certified organic farm in the Black Hills but they have a CSA they also do some farmers market sales and they sell directly um, as well they've got a great Facebook page um, too they also um, do um, chickens and turkeys. So they raise organic turkeys for people for Thanksgiving, um, and they raise um, chicken as well. And then Cycle Farms, um, they're in Spearfish. They have a CSA as well, and also sell at the farmer's market. And I think both of those are still um, accepting memberships for this year. Um, and then there's a couple of resources there. There's a link for Dakota Rural Action, um, IAC. One of the other things too that um, when we were in Denver for IAC, um, there was a woman, Angela was her name, who used to be in the um, Peace Corps and she met her husband in Tibet. And so um, she now spends most of the year in Tibet. She has a coffee house and a little hotel that's in a town. And then um, she brings um, handcrafted artwork to the U.S. And then also they do guided treks um, in, in Tibet um, with people, with the nomadic tribe that her husband is a part of. 
And so there were people who were at IAC, several of them who had been on treks with her group in the past. Um, but if you actually want to live with the nomads for a week or two weeks, or just one couple had been there for um, a full month, um, they're great experiences. But then she also has the cafe and coffee shop and hotel if you want something with a, a few more Western Americans. Where is that? Tibet. No, oh, it's in Tibet. Tibet. Oh, you have to go. <laughs> yeah, you have to go to Tibet. But, but she was there and they presented a, um, a slideshow of, of their experiences there. And again, there were several other couples who were there at IAC who had done the same thing in, in previous years, too. And she had great stories, too. And in fact, you know, she's very Western, um, but she talked about how, you know, all of the, the mountains are entities. And um, there's a sacred mountain that was not to be climbed. And there were two Coloradoans who climbed it um, several years ago. And they were the first two to ever climb it. Um, the next month, they climbed another mountain. Pretty simple one. They both died. And it was a mountain that was related to the sacred mountain. And so the perspective was that this mountain had caused their death because they had done something they weren't supposed to. And she said, you know, where you can kind of look at the spirituality in different ways, but she said, you know, they had a group out there, one year on a trek, they let the horses down, and they went out and did something, and one of the mountains was angry, and so it needed a blessing of some kind, and she said, I mean, like, they had looked for hours and hours and hours for these horses, they were nowhere to found. They did a little blessing um, to the mountain, and she said, in 10 minutes, the horses were there. <laughs> Um, but it was really, really, um, really interesting. Uh, we learned a lot about that. She said that you know the wealth of families is based on how many yaks they have. And she said there were there are some households where they had their tent and they were the women. She said did all the work. The men planned and they ride their motorcycle to town once in a while. But the, the women do all the work. And um, she said that there were women who were milking 200 yaks a day. Oh my wow. And then, you never you know, quit. creating cheese out of it and doing everything else. And, and the, the tents were made out of the guard hair from the yaks. And she said what they do is every year they leave a new section on the top and then just roll it down. So the area that gets the worst weather goes to the top. Um, and then um, the older stuff goes down and then it's finally removed. But the babies, the calves are brought in at night. Um, and that keeps the moms right outside for the morning. But it was, yeah, it was really, really fascinating. So, yeah, I know we're up at our time, but I don't know if you have any other questions. Do you have a deep well or springs on your land? We have a deep well, so it's about 500 feet, although the, the place that we purchased apparently it has a historic name, um, Whiskey Gulch. So um, on the Forest Service land, not too far from where we are, there's actually the remnants of uh, a spring that fed the still that was back there. Um, and yeah, we heard all kinds of stories from some of the locals about um, the history of Whiskey Gulch there. But so there are definitely some springs around, but we, we have a pretty deep well. Okay. Well, you're, do you say you have 10 acres? 10 acres for the cabins <coughs> and the farm, and then we have about five and a half for our house. So will that support the five yaks, or will you have to like raise on Forest Service, or? We will. We won't be raising on Forest Service. We'll probably do some supplementing, but also our friends who are the neighbors, they're willing to allow us to do some grazing on on some of their land. Mm -hmm. So when it says you oh, you're opening this spring, that means for your cabins that they're going to be ready for. That's the plan. So <laughs> yeah, you know, again, spring goes until like the 20th of June. Yeah. So. <laughs> and then, do you, are you going to do any kind of bed and breakfast, or is it people just come yeah. and, and rent the cabin? <laughs> Jim says no, no food. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I mean we'll probably do some sort of little gift basket or something. But um, people come and, and so they're so they have a little. Stove or something in the They'll cabin. actually have, they're 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 really going to be decent cabins. So okay. they're two by six construction, and I mean they've got good windows and all of that. But they'll have a full kitchen. It'll be compact, but it'll be a full kitchen and a grill. And assuming you know the fire conditions allow, um, campfire pits too. And the open house day will be when? <laughs> well, we'll see. But yeah, maybe, maybe sometime in June. That's kind of our hope. Wonderful. You were saying that they comb them for the hair. 
So did they not get any of the underdown to go? Because I thought with some of the yarns, they used some of that soft down. Yep, so the down is what they cone out. Well, that's what they're getting. Mm -hmm. Yep, the guard here stays attached. Okay. Mm -hmm. Horns. <laughs> yep. So, I mean, theoretically, that can still happen. And the one rancher by Buffalo, Wyoming, that we talked to, he said that whoever was responsible for picking up dead deer on the road started dumping them just outside of his fence on Forest Service land. So he said there was one year where he was pretty certain he lost a calf to a mountain lion. Um, and a cow, I think, had scratches or something. Um, but from the people that we've talked to, it hasn't, hasn't been an issue. So, the, yeah, their horns can, can protect them. Any other questions, though? Also up here, too, we do have some uh, menus from Everest. Again, they do a great job, um, and they're from Nepal originally. In fact, the gentleman that we arranged things with, um, his last name is Sherpa. He's part of a Sherpa family tradition. Um, have been climbers, and he's really excited about meeting the yaks and helping us with them too. Um, but uh, yeah, they do they do just a great job. There are also some brochures from Dakota Rural Action, and then um, Jim Anderson from Dakota Grass Fed Meats. I've got a sample of some um, socks that are made with the um, yak fiber, and then um, a little yak stuffed animal that's made with yak fiber as well. <laughs> and then Jim has a couple of the uh, cookeries which are the, the knives from Nepal that he picked up when he was there. And then there's also um, a Tibetan zodiac, which is really similar to the Chinese, except there's a yak instead of a cow. Um, <laughs> there. So, um, and again, the, the eye yak book. And then Claudia also left some information about spinners and local fiber. So please feel free to pick those up um, too. Oh, and then also I have a, um, um, oh, a bead that's um, carved from yak bone. I and mean, that's one of the other things, too, in terms of the nomadic cultures. Literally, I mean, every single piece of the yak is used. And so the, the bones are used to make beads um, and um, handles for knives and all kinds of other utensils. So, Jim, anything else? <laughs> Do they give off like a moo? Or anything oh, like cows? Good question. <laughs> they don't. In fact, their um, their scientific name is uh, Bos grunions, um, B O S, and then grunions, G R U N. Um, um, what they do is they, and that means grunting ox. So what they do is they grunt. So it's just kind of a, mm, mm. and so that's one of the things too that is a, is another sort of nice thing. So even like through weaning, you don't have calves and cows. Falling and they're they're very quiet. The other thing that surprised us too is the the lack of odor. You know, like if you if you scratch a horse or um, a sheep, you get a strong sense with the the yaks. It's like nothing. Maybe yeah. It's really just kind of a buff. Uh, a, a, I might actually have, I have some calves someplace here. Any other questions at all? Julie, you give me inspiration. Yeah, oh, okay. they sound ideal. It's a wonder they haven't been out here before this. Yeah, I think so. Can you hear that? Yeah. yeah. Can you turn it up and I'll play that again. These were two calves that were at uh, Oh, yeah. 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 Y